we associate that name with somewhat like a crown. We see that and we think Mufasa. Mufasa was important. Why? Because he was lying. Well, why are lions important? Because lions conduct themselves in a manner that we look at them and we say, those guys have power. Which is true. Lions, which is the strongest among beasts. Now, they may not be the most powerful. An elephant could step on a lion. But it's the way that a lion uses its strength. Okay? Female lions hunt in packs. They don't go out solo. Some animals do that. Lions don't. They stalk their prey. They wait until the opportune moment. Okay, they circle around and they drive them in certain directions. Some lions aren't there to attack. They're there to scare the animal or to drive it into a certain direction so that the other lions which are laying away, they always have a plan. Okay, they don't do things half-heartedly. They don't go out and just decide, well, you know what, I think we should hunt today and we're just going to go find an animal. They know the territory, right? They're the king of the jungle. They know where certain things are, where certain animals live, where they, you know, traverse to get to the watering hole or to get to wherever they're going. Okay, they know their territory. But finally, lions, what's the last part that it says? And they turn not away for any. If you challenge a lion, a male lion, female lion, if it's protecting its young, they're not going to back down from a fight. Okay, lions, if you come into their territory, will not back down. Even if it means that they have to lay down their own life, they will protect the rest of the pack. They'll protect the den. It's just a part of it. They, are. they don't turn away from many. They're used to being the strongest. They're used to having the authority, and they do not turn away.
one that we collectively as a church sat down and said, well, how do, you, how do we think that we can make the, the biggest impact? We do what thus saith the Lord. The plan that I have is the same plan that Jesus gave to the church before he ascended and is fine, you know, sat down once again at the right hand of the Father after he was resurrected. It's the same commission that that church had. It's the exact same plan that God had envisioned for the Emmanuel Baptist Church long before he ever created the earth. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. If God had to plan a salvation plan out, God already had a plan for those that would come to trust in him. Not my plan. It's God's plan. But knowing that it's God's plan, knowing that he will give me the strength to accomplish whatever it is that he tells me to do for him, why would I turn away from any? We should go as a lion, which is one that does not turn away, does not back down, does not get frightened, because he knows that he's the alpha. He knows that nothing can challenge him when he's at his best. And as long as I'm in the perfect will of God, I'm at my best. Not because I've done anything, but because he has turned me into the best that I can be while I'm in his perfect will. So, as a lion, we should go, go well, meaning that we're going the best that we can. It's a beautiful thing, a comely thing to the Lord when one of his children walks knowing that they are in the perfect will of God, knowing that they are doing the will of God, and knowing that nothing can stand in their way unless God allows it to come into their life. And if he does allow it to come into their life, he will give them the strength to either endure it or overcome it, as long as we do not turn away. If we do that, that's beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. That's beautiful to other Christians to know that other people aren't backing down, that there are still some that will stand next to you. We are supposed to be linked up arm in arm as the army of the living God. We are supposed to march as one, as a church, because we've been fitly framed together to become the body of Christ in this local called out assembly. But if all of us walk with that confidence, with that boldness from God, knowing that we're doing what God would have us to do, if we don't turn away, that's beautiful to the Lord. It's beautiful to each other. But others in the world, even though they may not understand how we can walk that way, how we can have that boldness, they will say that they do go well. If I go in the way of the Lord, I'm doing well, but also I'll conduct myself, I will have a life that shows that he's got something different. Other people can't go like him unless they've been saved. Other people can't have the confidence that they have unless they know that they're resting on the Lord's bosom, that they're underneath the Lord's wings, that he is their shepherd, and that they're following after him. So the first thing in this proverb that he says we should go as, that goes well, is a lion. Now the second, a greyhound. Okay, I didn't know that they had greyhounds in Bible days until I read this verse. I always thought that, you know, they just gave dogs names at some point in the last, I don't know, 500 years. Apparently not. Greyhounds around. Greyhounds are not giant buses. They are dogs. Greyhounds are also known for something. Now, some people have turned it into a vice and a sin, but greyhounds are known for being fast. They are lean they are agile. They're 90% legs. But they were bred to be fast. They were bred to run. Now, back in the day, they did not have greyhound race courses. That is not why greyhounds went fast. Greyhounds were hunting dogs. They were meant to catch the fastest prey. The fastest critter that even man couldn't run down. But... It, I can't run a lot of things down, but I've got... Ask Brother John, he can't outrun a deer, but his bullet can outrun a deer. Right? Man has developed weapons for hunting for years, but even those, we weren't either accurate, we weren't fast enough, for whatever reason, man wasn't able to hunt something that it wanted, but it knew that greyhounds were faster than what they were trying to hunt. 
So they bred, they trained, they mastered the greyhound in order to achieve victory over whatever vermin or whatever animal that they wanted to hunt, hence the greyhound. Okay, now greyhounds, something you need to know about greyhounds as I read about them, they don't just run fast to run fast. Again, they have to have a reason to run fast. You do not open the back door and a greyhound hits top speed. Right? You don't get to, you know, just watch a greyhound run laps around your backyard because it wants to go fast. Okay? The greyhound is not Ricky Bobby in that dumb movie. Okay? A greyhound has to be properly motivated. Now, greyhounds do not have riders like racehorses. Okay? The gates can open at a race course and a greyhound will not move unless properly motivated. That's why they have around the inside loop of the track that's why they have that fake animal. Sometimes it's a piece of cloth, sometimes it's a stuffed animal, but they are trained that when they see that it's to mimic prey. It's to mimic something that it's supposed to chase after. Okay, now it's moving so fast that the greyhound just gets a glimpse of something and then it triggers that drive in its brain that says, I gotta go get that. Okay, there are a lot of funny YouTube videos that I have discovered where puppy greyhounds are taken into the backyard and they've just got like fishing line run around two uh, motorized wheels in the backyard and it just spins a napkin along a track. And watching that dog chase a stupid napkin or whatever it was is the funniest thing. Some of them don't get it. They don't realize that they're supposed to go around. They try and grab it, and then they run the opposite direction to meet it halfway. Or they just wait there, and they just keep trying to bite it as it goes around. Right? But greyhounds have to be properly motivated. Some of them don't want to run. That's why they sit there and wait for the napkin to keep coming around. Okay, some of them, even if they've been trained properly, even if you do give them a reason to run. Some of them stay in the gate because they just don't want to run. Now a greyhound runs better according to our passage today than anything that this man had seen. It did something better than everything else. That's why it went well. That's why it was comely in its going. He's saying greyhounds are beautiful things to watch run because they do it better than everybody else. But not every greyhound runs. Not every greyhound is properly motivated. Okay, now, you can take all of us, line us up on the same line, give us the same thing to chase. Some of us don't want it. Why? Well, it depends on what it is. One, if it's Star Trek, I don't want it. If it's Star Wars, I'm in. Okay? If it's 90% of Marvel superheroes, I don't want it. If it's Batman, Superman, or DC, I'm in. That's just preference. But the sad thing is, is that preference has trickled in to Christianity. We're supposed to be like greyhounds. God gives us a task. We're meant to chase it. We're meant to do it to the best of our ability as fast as we can go. Doesn't matter if you're faster than me or if I'm slower than somebody else. I'm just supposed to run at my top speed. What did the Apostle Paul say? He said that I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. The Apostle Paul ran like a greyhound until he hit the finish line. The Apostle Paul never pulled up, never let up. And this is coming from a man that, I'd say in a month, experienced more adversity, more conflict, more reasons to quit the ministry than most of us have ever experienced in our life. He was tarred and feathered on more than one occasion. They tried to kill him more times than I can count on one hand. But God gave him the grace to get through all of it even though he was in prison in chains, being dragged to Rome, already lived through a hurricane that they gave a name to. It was called the Eurachlodon. Okay, gets stranded on an island with a bunch of barbarians, gets bit by a snake. I'm out right there. It's a venomous snake. Should have killed him. Didn't kill him. That's a miracle of God. Then, on top of that, all the other people think that, you know, he's some type of wizard or some type of devil all the barbarians, he says, no, it's not me, it's God. Gets through all of that, gets to Rome, still in prison. But God in his grace 
gave him charge to a centurion that after seeing how God had used them, the centurion didn't leave him rotten in a prison, gave him his own house, that while he was in Rome, under the care of that centurion, he was under house arrest. He had a sense of normalcy. But while he was in that house arrest, God arranged a way that people couldn't come and see him while he was in prison. But while he was in this house that the centurion had provided for him, people were able to come and hear the gospel, to hear him preach, to hear him as he was in chains, even though he was in a situation that most of us would have quit in, God gave him, because he was a greyhound running as fast as he could, wanting to do all that he could for God, gave him opportunities not just to witness to some people, but members of even uh, Caesar's family. He wrote in one of his epistles that we in Rome salute you, even Caesar's household. Caesar may not got saved. Agrippa may have not gotten saved. But some did. And Paul was thankful that the Lord used him, that the Lord gave him an opportunity to witness to others, and they got saved, and he just kept running as fast as he could. That's how we should be. When the gate opens, just go. Why not? He only gave us everything. He only owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He only is the God Jehovah, which if you've ever looked up what the word Jehovah means... It's the one who lives. It's the only God that lives. That's why we call him Jehovah. He's the only one that ever was alive of his own power. In fact, the only reason that man has life is because God breathed into the nostrils of man and man became a living soul. God gave life to man. Life is his. So if our God's the God that liveth, that means he's the only one with any power. And the only reason that man has power is because God gave power to man. So surely the creator is more powerful than the creation. If he tells me to go, we've already covered that I can go with confidence, but I should go as fast as I can. I should go with everything that's in me because he gave everything that he had for me. I should run like a greyhound because I am properly motivated. What motivation do we need to run as fast as we can? I could stand up here and preach all day long on the love of God, on the grace of God, on how we ought to love God. But really, what, what's it going to take? We've got every reason. The problem is, is that we don't love Him like we love cer certain other things. If He truly had priority in our life, we'd love Him like we were supposed to. If He's the most important, I'll love Him supremely. And if I love something supremely, I may not be able to run as fast as you, but I'll run as fast as I can. I used to be able to outrun Sydney when she was about in seventh grade. Can't do that no more. But I could still run. Some of us can't run. Some of us can walk. walk. But go as fast as you can. Go as hard as you can. Because time is short. The fields are white in the harvest, but the laborers are few. The laborers have always been few. Not because God doesn't want to save, but because most people don't want to hear. We know that salvation comes by the Word of God. How are they going to hear the Word of God? Or how are they going to receive the Word of God unless they hear the Word of God? How are they going to hear the Word of God without a preacher? The problem isn't that we don't have the Word of God. The problem isn't that there hasn't been preaching. It's that there's a lack of hearing of the Word of God. But if I go as fast as I can, I can tell more people. If I go as fast as I can, I can get the word out to more people. And the more that the world is saturated, saturated with the word of God, the more likely they are to believe in it. Some plant, some water. It's not my job to decide who does what. It's not my job to decide what I get to do. I'm just supposed to do what I can do and do it as hard and as fast as I can until God calls me home. But the third thing that this proverb talks about is the he-goat. A he-goat, had to do some looking up, is not a ram, okay? North Carolina Tar Heels, Brother Brian, not one of them, not with the curly horns, okay? A he-goat is a goat, male goat, that has straight horns, Okay? Now the thing about a he-goat or a male goat is that it may not be the biggest, 
It may not be the strongest, may not be the smartest, but it will go head to head with anything that gets in its way. You guys have seen videos of goats and rams lining up, running as fast as they can, and hitting each other. Now, I'm pretty sure that they didn't decide to do Hey, you know, it'd be fun today. But their bodies are built to handle that. Okay, the front of their skulls, where the horns go into the skull, actually have, in between the bone, pockets where there's a squishy substance that absorbs the impact so that they don't get brain damage. Okay? Now, those goats can do that all day long. It won't hurt them. They don't get dizzy. They aren't going to fall over. They're not going to get concussions like Christian when he played football. They're not going to see stars. It's what they were meant to do. But when challenged with something, they don't slow down. They don't stop. They don't try to go around it. They have a part of them that just says, I've either got to go through that or I'm going to hit that. Okay? Now there is a mentality that says, no matter what comes in my way, I'm going to face it. There's a mentality that says, no matter who's in my way, no matter what's in my way, I'm not going to slow down because God didn't tell me to slow down. Some people don't have that part of them that Jonah had that said, I don't, I don't want to go to Nineveh, I'm going to go to Tarshish. Other people have that part of them that says, God said to go to Rome, no matter what I got to go through, like the Apostle Paul, to get to Rome, I'm going to go. There are some people like John the Revelator, that even though he had been exiled, even though he had been cut off from everybody else, go and read the beginning of the book of Revelation, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, on the Isle of Patmos. He wasn't deterred. He was faced with exile in an island, and he didn't slow down. He faced it, and not faced it until he realized that, oh, he's going to hit it. Okay, most of us are okay until we realize, oh no, my car's going to hit that. What do we do? We hit the brakes. It's a part of human nature to say, ooh, that might hurt. Now, yes, we may get cuts and bruises as Christians spiritually, but Jesus is the balm of Gilead. Amen. But we're not talking about being injured. We're talking about staring down the barrel of a loaded gun and saying, I will not renounce the name of Jesus Christ. I will not back down. I will not give up on the Word of God. Knowing what's about to transpire, whether it's a brick wall, whether it's another goat, whatever it is, we face it head first. Now most Christians are so timid because they don't have Holy Ghost boldness or are so contrary that they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or they don't want to rub anyone the wrong way that they don't face things head on they back into them and see if they can, you know, schmooze or negotiate or try and not hurt everybody's feelings but get everybody on the same side. This Bible divides. It is a sharp two-edged sword. Not everybody's going to agree with it. You didn't agree with it before you got saved. But while you were lost, you knew that the book was right. That's why you felt conviction. Okay, not everybody's on this side. Not everybody we'll get out of our way as we're running as fast as we can like a greyhound. Now the lion doesn't back down from a challenge but a lion's smart enough to know I shouldn't run into that. A goat knows that it can take it. A lion, if it hits another lion head on that's going to do some damage. But a goat's built for it. They're meant to lock eyes with whatever's in the way and to meet it halfway. Whether it's a lion's den like Daniel, whether it's a furnace like them three Hebrew boys, whatever was in their way, they didn't back into it. What did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say? We are not careful to answer thee, O king. They spoke with boldness. They went as fast as they could like a greyhound, but when the fiery furnace was put in their face and heated to seven times hotter than it had ever been heated, when they were about ready to get thrown in and it had already killed the guards that tried to throw them into the furnace. 
The entire time they didn't back, slow up. They didn't change course. They just said, we're standing for God. They met the furnace head on. And because they did, because their faith was, as they told Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to renounce his name. We will not bow to the false idol that you have made. Some people just face the furnace, not because they're not afraid of what might happen, but because they have faith that God is able to conquer it. And if he doesn't, it was his will for me to go into the furnace. So there's a reason for it. What's the worst that can happen? I'm going to heaven. This is as close to hell as I'll get. So why would I slow down? Why would I change course? We should be like that. He go. But because the Hebrew boys were like the he go, there was a fourth man in the fire. And as Nebuchadnezzar said, he was like unto the Son of God. Jesus met him in the fire. He was waiting on him. He knew they were going into the fire. But even when they were brought out of the fire, not only was not a single hair burned on their head, not only was the only thing that was burned up in the fire their bonds that they were tied with, they got to have a little, you know, case of the can't help it's in the fire when they met Jesus. Okay, but when they came out, it didn't even smell like smoke. Not because they were anything special, but because they knew that it was the right thing to do not to bow. That they would only bow for their God. The God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that is the I am that I am. Jehovah. But not just them, Daniel. Daniel prayed three times daily. That's more than some Christians today. But morning, noon, and night, everybody knew where to find him. Everybody knew what he'd be doing. People ask him, hey, you want to go grab it? Can't. Got to go pray. That's my time with God. Other people got jealous of him because he was rising through the ranks of favor with King Darius. And because he found favor in the eyes of the king, and he was an outcast. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Some of us are outcast in the eyes of the world. They want to seek to destroy us. Well, these other men were successful in trying to destroy Daniel. They had the king pass a law that maybe unbeknownst to the king, maybe not. He said, yeah, sounds like a good idea, not realizing that his pen stroke would cause Daniel, one of the men that he favored, to be thrown into the lion's den. He didn't want to throw Daniel in. How do you know that? Because first thing in the morning, after he threw him in, he went running to the lion's den saying, I wonder if he's all right. He cared about Daniel. He opened it up and he said, Daniel, is your God able? Amen. Daniel answered, yeah. He always was, always is. But yeah, he was last night. He shut up the lion's mouth. But because Daniel, even after the law was passed, even after he had been warned, even after they, they had told him, hey, we're going to throw you either in prison or in the lion's den. We're going to try and kill you. What did he do? Morning, noon, and night. Knowing that they'd be waiting for him, knowing that they knew where he prayed, and that as he prayed, they'd probably either be there already or they'd be coming to get him. He didn't back up. He faced it head on. Some people are okay to run as fast as they can until something is in the way or until someone is in the way or until they realize that I'm going to hit that. Maybe I need to slow down or change course. If God didn't say slow down, don't slow down. Some things are worth standing for. Some things are worth fighting for. And the Lord rewards those not that through doubt slow down or through doubt change direction or through doubt just throw on the brakes altogether and say, well, God obviously wanted me to stop. God rewards those that through faith say, Lord, I believe that you're bigger than whatever's in my way. And Lord, I know that you're bigger than what's ever in my way, but if you decide not to deliver me, I'll see you in the morning. I'll see you as you are. I'll be at your feet in heaven praising and thanking you. I'd rather have that going out on a high note than having to stand before God and give an account of the fact that my faith was not strong enough in the Lord and that I had to back down because I trusted in the arm of flesh more than I trusted in the hand of God. 
The ego doesn't back down. Because it knows that it can handle it. God, when he made us a new creature, gave us everything that we have that we can conquer the world. Not because I'm anything special, but because God's greater than the world. God now lives in me. And because God is in me, I now can go and conquer the world. But in order to conquer, I've got to continue to go. You don't establish an empire. You don't establish a continent-wide you know, conquest by stopping halfway. By saying, you know what, the mountains are pretty tall. I think, I think we've done enough. That doesn't cut it. In order to conquer, you must go to everywhere that you need to go. In order to be the Christian that God called us to be, I have to be willing to go to the uttermost parts of the world. He may never call me there, but I have to have it purposed in my heart that I will go if he calls me. Because if I won't go there, where else will I go? If I won't do this, what else won't I do? My faith in him has to be so complete that no matter what's in my way, just like a billy goat, I won't back down. I'll meet it head on. And if I do it in faith, because without faith it's impossible to please God, but if I do it with faith and through obedience and through submission, I'll absorb the impact because God will take the impact for me. You really think David threw that stone hard enough to kill Goliath? No. You really think that David sunk that stone into the one spot that Goliath didn't have armor? I don't have armor right here, but I got a pretty hard head. It's going to take a strong throw to put a rock to where it is sunk into my head. You could throw a rock and probably crack my head, but in order to get the rock sunken into my head, that takes a big throw, and I'm not as big as Goliath was. Right? No. God smacked him in the front of the head and the back of the head at the same time, which is why he fell on his face. David didn't even have a sword to kill Goliath, but he had to use Goliath's own sword, which weighed so much that he probably had to drag it over and just let it drop. Proof of the fact that David didn't do it. But he had faith that this uncircumcised Philistine that denied the armies of the living God would be punished by that God for the stand that he took against God's people. David just had faith. And because he had faith and he was willing to go, and because he didn't change directions, he was willing to meet his head on. When Saul, who was the biggest Israelite, he was head and shoulders above the, every Israelite, when he was too afraid, when his older brothers were too afraid, just a little shepherd boy who had a touch of God, who walked with God, who sang with God, or sang to God, who just praised him while he was out keeping his father's sheep, had enough grit about him that he said, I'm not afraid to run that guy down. Not because I could take him, but because God can. Because he was just like a he goat. But finally, the last thing, the only animal that he doesn't talk about, and a king against whom there is no rising up. Now, a true king has all authority, has all power. If he doesn't, he may call himself a king, but he's not, by definition, a king. Okay, the reason we do not have a king in America is because power is supposed to be divided between three branches. But, in all honesty, all power resides in all the companies that lobby and buy politicians. But, we won't get on that today. But, point being, the king has all power. There is no rising up against a true king because he has all the power. You cannot usurp authority over someone who has all the authority. Okay, now David, we'll go back to David, as king, realized that he did not have all power because God was his God. He knew that God had all power. David was not the one that delivered himself from the hands of Saul so many times. God was. David was not the one that delivered himself out of the tens of thousands that he slayed on the battlefield. God was. And David knew that. He knew that God had all power and that no one could rise up against God or the man that God had on the throne, which is why he survived all the attempts that Saul had to kill him. But also, when one of his sons, Absalom, tried to rise up against David, 
Absalom took the city of Jerusalem for a time. But God, who had all power, saw that Absalom died. Not in battle, not with David coming back victoriously and slaying his own son. Because David in his heart didn't want that. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and God will give you to the desires of your heart. Because God hung Absalom in a tree. Got caught by his own hair while riding on a horse. Broke his neck. Why? Because David, God knew that David couldn't kill his own son. He loved him too much. But David knew that God had all power and there was no rising up against God. David lived to be an old man. Not because he was overly healthy. Not because he had a, you know, great physician because he was the king, but because God gave him grace. Same reason that God saw fit to put him on the throne. Because David was a man after God's own heart. But David knew there was no rising up against God. Now, I know that there's no rising up against God, which is why I can walk with boldness, which is why I can run like a greyhound, which is why I can face anything down and not turn away. But God also made me a king. He has made us kings and priests, kings to rule and reign over this body. This flesh should not be able to rise up against me. There is no rising up against the king because the king not only has all authority, the king has all power. The king is the ruling and reigning body of that country, of that city, of whatever he is king over. God hath made me king of me. Now he's my king, but he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Some people like to think that when it says king of kings, he just means all the kings that have ever been kings. No, he's the king of kings because he made everyone that he saved a king. So both are true. But we're not preaching on that today. Point is, he made me a king so that I could have authority and power over this flesh. So that I can deny the desires of the flesh. So that I can overcome the temptations of the flesh. There is no rising up against the king, but most of us take our crown off and put it on the shelf. We're happy living in a miry existence as a Christian where sometimes we're hit, sometimes we're miss, sometimes we might be more miss than hit, sometimes we might be more hit than miss, but a man cannot serve two masters. He will love one and hate the other. What was the Lord's uh, rebuke of the church of Laodicea? That they were increased with goods, that they thought that they had need of nothing, but that they were lukewarm and that God would spew them out of his mouth. He would that they were either cold or hot. Because if they were cold, they know they're cold and know that they need to get warm. But if they were hot, they know that they could run like a greyhound, that they could go like a lion, that they could be a billy goat when anything got in their way. But too many of us don't take up our kingship that the Lord wishes us to take up to where I can command this flesh. Am I still going to have bad days? Yeah. Are you going to have bad days? Yeah. I don't see halos, and we're not in heaven yet. This flesh is still cursed by sin. That's why it has to go back to the dust of the earth. But I can reign over the flesh by seeking him early in the morning. The psalmist said, early will I seek thee. By hiding the word of God in my heart that I might not sin against him. By taking that song that he put in my heart and singing it on days when I don't feel like running as fast as I can. On days where I don't feel like I have confidence to charge hell with a gasoline can. On days where I don't feel like facing down something else. This flesh won't want to, but the Spirit can compel the flesh to do what it would. If I sacrifice my ambitions, my desires, the willingness of the flesh to seek after the worldly things, then I can take up that kingship that Christ gave me. If daily I kill off the old man and embrace the new man, I can keep the flesh from rising up against me. A king goes well because he knows that nobody can challenge him. We can live a great Christian life when we realize that this flesh can't control us. I don't have to be in bondage or sub subjugation to the flesh. I can compel myself to get out of bed and come to church. I can compel myself to hand out gospel tracts. But it's not just a desire of I can. All of these things have to do with 
the willingness or the ambition or the desire, the motive to go. If a lion's tired, it's not going to walk around and not turn away from anything. It's going to go sleep. If a greyhound doesn't have something to chase, it's not going to run. If a billy goat is scared of whatever it's about ready to run into, it's not going to run into it. If a king is insecure and thinks that he doesn't have all power, he won't walk like he has all power. When we realize that this does mean what it says, that he has made me what he has made me, that he is who he said he is, and if we love him and he has the preeminence in our life like he's supposed to, that nothing else comes before him in our life. We'll walk like a lion. We'll run like a greyhound. We'll charge like a goat. And we will rule like a king. All four of these things do something better than everything else that God created. But as a Christian, <coughs> as a Christian, we should embrace the best of all four of those things. Apply them to our spirituality and realize that some days we're not going to feel like running, but I can keep running through the grace of the Lord. Some days I'm not going to want to charge whatever God's allowed to come into my life, but He'll give me the strength. We are yoked together with Him. He said, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He's charging it with me. I'm linked up with Him. That's why I can conquer whatever he told me to charge. That's why I can run when I don't feel like I'm running. Sometimes I won't be the one running. He'll be carrying me as we go. Sometimes I'm not going to have the boldness in and of myself. I'm not going to have the confidence to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. But by faith, he can give me grace and mercy enough to stand in the time where nobody else will stand or where only I can deliver whatever message he wants me to deliver, where I can reach the one that only I can reach, and he'll give me the boldness of that line. And if I walk hand in hand with Jesus, I can live as a king over this flesh to where when the flesh says, you know what, you don't need to run today. Yeah, I do. I need to run because he gave me something to do. I need to charge because if I don't, somebody on the other side of this obstacle may die and go to hell. I need to walk with boldness so that others can see my light shine and glorify my Father which is in heaven. That they can see a light that penetrates into their darkness and shows them that they are halt, lame, deaf, and blind and that Jesus is the one that can cure their spiritual condition. I can do all these things if I rely upon Him to do them. But also, if I just purpose in myself that he's given me enough reason to want to desire to live this type of a Christian life. To live like these creatures in this king. To be the victorious Christian that Christ called me to be. Instead of so many times being the opposite of all these things. Or having a moment where we don't do this. And we either have to pay the consequences or someone else will pay the consequences. If we live a life like this, we'll live a life without regret. We'll live a life without shame, without doubt. We will live a life as the Christian that Christ called us to be.